Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to introduce our colloquial speaker for today, Professor Michael Turner. He is the Bruce and Diana Rauner Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Chicago. He's also a visiting Miller Fellow here for the current two months. Professor Turner received his bachelor's degree at Caltech in 1971 and his PhD from Stanford in 1978. He has a very distinguished record of all his accomplishments. He is a fellow of the American Physical Society, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a member of the American Philosophical Society and a legacy fellow of the American Astronomical Society. He has achieved, he has been given numerous awards, of which I'll mention just three the Warner Prize of the American Astronomical Society, the Lillian Field Prize of the American Physical Society, and the Heinemann Prize for Astrophysics of the American Astronomy Society and the Institute of Physics. He also holds many positions other than his professorship at Chicago. He's a member of the NRC Astronomy Decadal Survey, Chair of the APS Division of Astrophysics, Chair of the Physics Section of the National Academy, and on the Senior Editorial Board of Science Magazine. As a final comment on his accomplishments, he is the person who coined the term dark energy, about which we're about to learn a great deal. His title is Cosmology, What We Know, What We Don't Know, and What We Don't Know, We Don't Know. Please join me in welcoming Professor Turner. Um, thank you very much, John. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I wish you had left out some of the dates. <laughs> <laughs> and um, some of those things you mentioned I'm no longer doing, but nonetheless, thank you very much. Um, so I'm very uh, happy to be here, and I'm going to be here for two months. And I I put this, uh, this building is actually older than I am, but that that's not the reason I put the picture up. I put the picture up so that you'll know where to come see me in, in uh, I think it's called South Physics 419. Um, so this is a talk on cosmology. And um, uh, I thought maybe, you know, at least for the graduate students, um, what's the definition of cosmology? According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the science or theory of the universe as an ordered whole and of the general laws that govern it. That's pretty good. Uh, I, Google was even closer, the science of the origin and development, uh, we would often call that the evolution of the universe. And then Google went on uh, to enthuse a little more. And um, the underlying part is the part that I like, is, is dominated by the Big Bang Theory, uh, which brings together observational cosmology and particle physics. So, not all the words in that sentence completely make sense, but I think those are some of the themes. Um, um, so first of all, you know, when you talk about your subject, you need to tell the audience how difficult it is. Um, and so the remit is the universe, and the universe is really big, a um, couple hundred billion galaxies, and everybody got really excited by the JWST deep field. And I think there's probably five or 10,000 galaxies in this, all the smudges, but it's like one 10 millionth or 20 millionth of the entire sky. Um, uh, and of course, galaxies are fun. There's lots of them and they have 100 billion stars and similar number of planets. The planets aren't that interesting. Uh, <laughs> at least to a cosmologist. Uh, galaxy cluster, 13.7, actually, I think it's closer to 13.8 billion years. This is an old slide, um, years old. Um, and um, the universe 
is really challenging. It's often beyond the reach of our instruments and even our most powerful ideas. But the last 100 years, uh, both due to developments in instrumentation and in ideas, have uh, really defined modern cosmology, and there's been a lot of progress. And I thought I would show some pretty pictures. Um, uh, this is the giant Lick refractor. I think at one point was the biggest telescope in the universe, it's a 36 inch lens telescope. And then came along the reflectors. Um, this is the 100 inch telescope on Mount Wilson that Hubble used, the 200 inch on Mount Palomar. Uh, probably 10 years from now, we won't recognize the Hubble telescope, but people still recognize it. And there's JWST. And I partic I've had to put this picture in. So those of you who got up and watched the launch must have seen the final picture of JWST before it went out to L2, taken from the uh, Ariane rocket. And then, of course, the ground-based telescopes that I show the two Keck 10-meter telescopes here on top of Mauna Kea. And it's always fun to try to put in numbers and justify them. Um, so of course, Galileo 400 years ago, you know, turned the microscope to the sky and uh, started all this. The, the improvement in sensitivity is, a, is about a factor of 100 billion. Um, and I can even justify that number, but uh, it, over a drink. Uh, it's not just aperture, it's, you know, you're using CCDs and photo, instead of photographic plates. And the ideas are important. Um, uh, Newton's theory is just not up to describing the whole universe. Um, a big theme here is that uh, we need to know what the universe was made of at the beginning. And that early phase when it's reduced to its most fundamental constituents, quark soup, um, is really important. And then I'll talk about um, uh, inflation, one of the dominant ideas in modern cosmology. Um, and I promise not to dwell too much on history, but it's, it's fun to see the flow. Um, uh, Hubble, uh, during this remarkable period from 1925 to 1929, used this telescope, the 100-inch Hooker telescope, a uh, big refract, uh, sorry, reflecting telescope, to first of all, show that there are other galaxies in the universe, which is stunning. In 1924, we didn't know that. Uh, we thought there was just, well, there were some that speculated, but uh, so he enlarged, he's a University of Chicago graduate, by the way, uh, enlarged the universe by a factor of 100 billion. And then, of course, he was the one who uh, put together and established the expansion of the universe. And the expansion of the universe, of course, po uh, points back to, to the Big Bang. And everybody's looking at who is that amazing cyclist? That's me. And you know, if you ever get down to Southern California, and I guess people in the Northern California never do, but should you? <laughs> it's an amazing place uh, to see, almost as good as almost as good as Mount Hamilton and Lick. And uh, you can see the, the telescope, and they have docents and all of that. Um, and again, the the role of theory is really important. Um, because without general relativity, you can't really discuss the universe. And uh, the expansion of the universe is, is not, you know, firecracker going off. It's really an expansion of space and galaxies being carried along. So uh, no one, everyone's at the center. No one's at the center. Uh, the velocities that, that we've measured ever since, uh, those velocities that increase with distance. So the the galaxies that are further away are moving faster. Um, that's just, that's, that's not uh, a Doppler effect. That's redshift. That's the, the wavelength of the photons being expanded by the expansion of the universe. And so when we measure redshifts, we're really measuring the size of the universe uh, when the light was emitted relative to what it is today. Um, and of course, uh, 1964, uh, Penzias and Wilson happened upon this mysterious microwaves that uh, uh, come from all directions that uh, are the microwave echo of the Big Bang. We call it the cosmic microwave background. They have a temperature of around three degrees, and as the universe expanded, they cooled. So that tells us, and this is very important, uh, hot beginning, 
So in the beginning, the universe looked very different. It was cork uh, soup. And now we get to the Berkeley part. Uh, the COBE satellite uh, in 1992 discovered that there are tiny variations in the intensity of the microwave background, about 18 uh, microkelvin, um, a part in 10 to the 5, uh, that map out the distribution in the matter at, at the very uh, beginning and tell us it was a very smooth Big Bang. Um, equally impressive um, is uh, the measuring the spectrum of the microwave background, the FIRAS instrument on COBE, um, which found no deviations from a black body at 0.005%. That's really hard to do. Uh, it's very impressive. And measured the temperature to four significant figures. Okay, now we're up to 1980. Um, and in 1980, the vocabulary of cosmology got changed um, by ideas coming in from particle physics, ideas like uh, inflation, quark soup, baryogenesis, dark matter, and dark energy. Um, and I'll come back to that again later. That was completely unexpected that there would be this connection between particle physics and uh, cosmology. The, here I, uh, around the year 2000, the first three-dimensional maps of the universe uh, were produced. Um, and I show, this is the Hubble deep field that the JWST deep field replaced. And that's just, you know, positions on the sky. If you measure the velocities and use the Hubble law, you can get the distance. And this is a, a, a wedge of a three-dimensional uh, picture of the universe. Here We're here, and you go out in space, and you can see that there is some structure. There are uh, sheets or walls, and there are voids, and that structure re re uh, uh, reproduces itself. Um, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, I think, had a million galaxies, and um, I think the, there's a project, the DESI project up at Berkeley, I think it's already, it, they're counting, it's like McDonald's. I think I went and looked at the sign on Friday and it was 20 million uh, redshifts, but you know, it was a big weekend. It's probably, it's 30 million by now. Uh, but defining the structure of the universe. Um, and then uh, back to Berkeley again, uh, the discovery that uh, the universe, which should be slowing down due to gravity, I mean, isn't its defining feature that it's attractive is actually speeding up, um, and that graced the cover of uh, Science Magazine, kicked off all those biologists, breakthrough discovery of 1998, and I think that was the Nobel Prize in 2011. I forget the year. I think I got that right. Uh, and I think this guy has some association with Berkeley. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, so what do we know today? Um, it's embodied in an amazing theory that has this funny combination of Greek and Latin letters. So lambda, cold, dark matter. So the lambda um, is the dark energy part that explains uh, why the universe, or is, explains why the universe is speeding up. And it's quite a remarkable uh, framework. And I, I won't show you all the evidence, but the body of evidence that supports it is really amazing. OK, so here's the English version uh, that you can read to your children at night. Um, and we don't quite know when the beginning was, so it doesn't go all the way back. Uh, but very early on, there was an accelerated expansion driven by the potential energy of a scalar field uh, that gives rise to very large, smooth, spatially flat patches, one of which will become the universe we see today. So that's inflation. Quantum fluctuations during this accelerated phase grow into the seeds for galaxies. So uh, the seeds for galaxies came from really small things. The conversion of potential energy of the scalar field into heat produces quark soup. In the quark soup, it develops an excess of matter over antimatter um, and dark matter particles. 
the excess of quarks over antiquarks becomes neutrons and protons, and some of those, uh, the light elements, and finally atoms. And the gravity of the dark matter drives the formation of structure, uh, provides the infrastructure uh, for uh, the structures we see in the universe today, from galaxies to superclusters. And about five billion years ago, this repulsive gravity of this dark energy caused the universe uh, expansion to uh, speed up. So that's the English version of this. Um, um, so inflation um, involves, as best as we can describe it, a field that might be a cousin, at least now we can say this, to the Higgs field. And uh, so this field starts high on its potential energy curve. And so that's a lot of energy and that drives the, the nearly exponential expansion and it rolls down this hill and the potential energy gets converted into uh, uh, inflaton particles that decay into the quark soup. And we don't know when this happened, uh, but a number like 10 to the minus 32 seconds, more expansion in that time than in the next 15 billion years. And so all that we can see today, uh, according to this picture, evolved uh, from the tiniest bit of the universe. Uh, and this tremendous expansion takes this tiniest bit of the universe that we could imagine to be smooth and blows it up to a big smooth universe like we see. And if it had any curvature, that curvature would be flattened out and predicts that our universe should be spatially curved. And then this um, amazing feature of inflation is everything gets blown up, including quantum fluctuations. And so uh, fluctuations on scales much smaller than the size of an atom get stretched to scales much bigger than you can imagine, to astrophysical scales. And uh, these fluctuations become the seeds for galaxies. And so we've got quark soup and some dark matter particles in there and an excess of quarks over antiquarks. And so when the universe is about 10 to the minus five seconds old, uh, the quarks condense into neutrons and protons. And when the universe is seconds old, nuclear reactions take place that produce a lot of helium, a little bit of uh, deuterium, some helium-3, and some lithium. Um, by the time the universe is 400,000 years, it's only a few thousand degrees uh, Kelvin. So here it was a billion. Here it was uh, um, 10 to the 13. What's that? 10 trillion degrees. And atoms form. I can see my, uh, do we have another pointer? <laughs> Either my finger's going bad or the, uh, uh, and uh, so the atoms form and the universe becomes transparent to radiation. Uh, so when the universe is ionized, it's very opaque. It becomes transparent to radiation and the light that comes to us uh, gets redshifted by the expansion of the universe. So it's visible light here. And by the time it's redshifted by the expansion from here to today, that's about a factor of 1,000, it becomes microwaves. And so it's here that, oops, it's, uh, well, you'll have to use your imagination between, oh, there we go, 400,000 years. And today, uh, gravity takes over, and the gravity of dark matter builds up the structure that we see in the universe today. Oh. And then uh, somewhere around there, the universe starts speeding up uh, due to uh, the repulsive gravity of dark energy. Um, and so I've blown up the last little phase um, to, sh oh, thank you very much. Oh, that looks really bright. Sorry for wearing out the battery. Um, Oops, boy, I have the real touch here. <laughs> oh, there. oh, there we go, okay. Um, so here we are today, we look out in space, we look back in time, and here's uh, the universe at about 400,000 years when it's going from being ionized uh, to neutral atoms, and here's a photon, it last scatters and comes to us, 
And so we see these as the photons of the microwave background. And uh, we're literally seeing the last scattering surface, which is the universe at 400,000 years. And so now you can ooh and ah at that picture. Um, Kobe got the first snapshot. And uh, its angular resolution was about 7 degrees. Uh, WMAP, a satellite that went up, uh, oh, wow, was it only 10 years later? Uh, seemed like longer than that. Uh, a, f a f uh, better resolution, a fraction of a degree. And then the uh, European satellite, the Planck satellite, has made the best map. Um, And so there it is. This is the Rorschach test for whether or not you're a cosmologist. OK. Anybody's heart going pitter-patter? OK, there you are. You're a cosmologist. Others will just say, that looks like Gaussian random noise, <laughs> which is what inflation says it should be. It's just the uh, uh, Gaussian fluctuations of a weakly coupled scalar field. If you look really carefully, uh, yeah, you can see if you've got a really good agent, they can get your product placed, even in a picture like that. S-H, Stephen Hawking. And you can probably find just about any letters you want in this. Um, and um, this is probably the best evidence that we have for the Lambda CDM uh, paradigm. And uh, so if instead of just staring at that picture, uh, you take the multiple transform, or, or measure the, uh, the correlation in the temperature on different angular scales from big angular scales to small angular scales, uh, this is what pops out. And there's a curve in there, which is not a curve that was drawn by me last night to go through the points, but that's uh, the prediction of lambda CDM. It's got six um, adjustable parameters, but it's going through an awful lot of points. And so that, that's pretty amazing. Uh, last time I counted, in the United States, it takes 10 numbers to do telephones. But Lambda CDM can do the universe with six numbers. So that, that's pretty impressive. Um, the, one of the things that's stunning is, so this is a piece of the microwave background. And remember, if, if this story is correct, if inflation is correct, then what we're seeing here is Gaussian random noise on scales much smaller than the size of a proton projected onto the sky. And, and uh, those, yeah, what did I do here? Is there two buttons? Oh, there we go. Uh, that ultimately becomes the seeds for things as large as galaxies and clusters of galaxies. So uh, quantum is a big word today. And I think the cosmologists own the biggest quantum connection. Um, OK, what else? Um, so this is the district. I, I don't know what I'm, oh, there we go, OK. Um, so this is the distribution of matter when the universe was 400,000 years old, where it's brighter, there's more, more matter, and where it's less, where it's bluer, there's less matter. And so this is the initial conditions uh, for simulating structure in the universe. And it's been done by many groups. You take these initial conditions, put it on a computer, and does it match uh, the map of the distribution of galaxies? And uh, you can have a big discussion of that, but yes is the answer. And you can quantify this by uh, saying, uh, what, is the dist what, is the, uh, what is the power spectrum of lumpiness in the universe from galaxies up to the biggest scales we can imagine? And you can measure it various ways, the microwave background, uh, the dark energy surveys, uh, another survey that Berkeley was involved, the BOSS survey. And those are the data points, and there's the curve. So we could keep going on with data. Um, but uh, I'm a theorist, so you can only take too much, so much data. Uh, it's also revealed new physics. So um, the speed up of the universe, uh, 
uh, is due to the repulsive gravity of dark energy. Um, okay, and lambda is the simplest example there we are, uh, of dark energy. It's just the quantum energy of the vacuum. Um, inflation, I talked about inflation, so this early burst of tremendous expansion. Um, oh, and we don't know what dark energy is. Uh, and inflation, uh, wonderful, uh, but we, didn't, we haven't discovered that field yet. And the gravity of slowly moving dark matter particles, we call it cold dark matter, is what built all the cosmic structures and holds them together. And I'll give short shrift to this. Uh, just the ordinary matter that we're made of uh, wouldn't be here unless there were an excess of uh, matter over antimatter early on. Uh, so that uh, some of the matter would survive annihilation with the antimatter. Boy, I'm having fun with this pointer. Okay, that's what we know. Um, let's see. What we know, we don't know. I think I got that right. So these are the things that we don't know. Um, and this list will look very similar <laughs> because. Uh, the pillars of this model uh, are basically the things we don't know. So 69%, give or take six tenths of a percent of the universe today is dark energy. And uh, we don't really know what it is. And I'll go on to say um, our simplest example is quantum vacuum energy. Uh, and that would be a great example if theorists could calculate it and say, this is how much the vacuum weighs. And they can calculate it, and they get a number that's very close to that. Uh, it just differs by 55 orders of magnitude. Um, what else? Uh, inflation. So inflation was a very important part of this model. Uh, can't tell you when inflation took place. Can't tell you uh, what the name of the field is that supposedly did it. Uh, Okay, let's let's go with this. I'm going to break all. What's my limit on the number I can before I have to start paying? Okay, right. Okay, we're going to red. I think red is my. There we go. Uh, and the dark matter, um, thirty-one percent uh, less. Whatever. Oh, let's go to the baryons. So the baryons are about five percent measured to uh, sub. 0.1% uh, precision. Uh, we don't know how they survived annihilation. Um, and uh, the dark matter, uh, so that's the you know 31 minus 5, 26 percent. Uh, we don't know what it's comprised of. Uh, so this is one of these wonderful models. We've um, somebody mentioned that I came up with the term dark energy, and so. Um, just naming something isn't good enough. <laughs> so we succeeded in naming all these things. Some people have said, well, maybe these just represent, you know, epicycles, like the old Ptolemaic system. Uh, and well, I think the class is both half full and half empty, and the graduate students should be very excited. So if the glass were completely full and I said, oh, we know what the dark matter is, I got a bottle of it right here, it has a name, and we know its mass, we know it's blah, blah, blah then there'd be nothing to do. So there are at least four big puzzles here. Um, and we've been able to we put together this beautiful story that matches uh, the data that we have um, that leaves us puzzles to go ahead and solve. Uh, dark matter. Um, let's drill down on that one a little. Oh, I thought I advanced it. Let's drill down, drill down on dark matter a little bit. Um, so uh, galaxies like our own and clusters of galaxies are held together by the gravity of dark matter. Um, if we didn't put in dark matter particles in the numerical simulations, you couldn't reproduce the structure that we see today. So it's absolutely necessary. Um, it's much more diffuse going on with things we know about it. Um, than the stellar matter. So if you take a galaxy, the visible part looks like this, and the dark matter is an enormous halo, 10 times uh, larger than that. Um, we know that the particles, um, two things. 
move slowly. So in the thermodynamic sense, they're cold. If they move too fast, they would run out of these beautiful density perturbations made by inflation and wouldn't produce the structures we see. And they're bashful. So they, they don't interact uh, with ordinary matter very much, uh, at most weakly. Um, and this is really important. Um, you might say, well, can't the dark matter just be you know, dead stars or something? Um, so there aren't enough atoms in the universe to account for it, so it must be something new. And so I just want to show one slide on this. Um, so we have a couple of ways of measuring the amount of baryons. So omega baryon is the fraction of baryons, uh, the fraction of the critical density in baryons. And this is the Hubble constant in units of 100 for historical reasons. And the microwave background, the shape of these peaks, one of the things that you get out is uh, how many baryons there are. You can also measure that from the amount of deuterium made in the Big Bang. And that's a whole nother story. These two numbers agree to better than 1%. Uh, one involving nuclear physics in the universe when it was seconds old, the other involving uh, uh, gravitational and atomic physics when the universe was 400,000 years old. Anyway, that's the, the amount of ordinary matter. The total amount of matter comes from uh, uh, galaxy surveys and from the microwave background. And it's a number that differs from the amount in baryons by more than 50 sigma. In fact, I don't think it matters how many, you know, once it's over 10 sigma, uh, you aren't going to solve it with a statistical fluctuation. Maybe there's something wrong. But this says that the, the dark matter can't be made out of atoms, or at least things that were in the form of, of uh, neutrons and protons uh, at the time of nucleosynthesis and the formation of the microwave background. Um, for about 20 years, this slide was a really good slide because uh, we said, we've got a compelling model. Um, it's either the axion. So this is a very light particle that was predicted by particle physicists who were trying to solve the strong CP problem of QCD, or the lightest supersymmetric particle, the neutralino, or neutrinos. And um, neutrinos, uh, we now know, um, can't contribute that 30%. Uh, they're in a race with stars. So the interesting question now is, are there more neutrinos than there are stars? Uh, I'm hoping that there are more neutrinos than there are. I mean, there are more neutrinos than there are stars, but weight-wise. Uh, so neutrinos probably contribute around 0.1%, maybe a little higher. Um, uh, so what's wrong with this picture? So this picture was so compelling that it launched experiments um, at particle accelerators looking for the neutralinos, um, uh, underground experiments that you're very familiar with here that look for uh, th the neutralinos that would interact in a very sensitive detector, um, and experiments that look for neutralinos or similar particles that would annihilate in the halo. And likewise, experiments look for axions. And they have roughly the right sensitivity. At least they have the sensitivity that the theorists told them they needed to make a discovery, but the theorists always change the predictions. And nothing, nothing yet. So we're at a, uh, a crossroads here. And um, I'm confused, because I like that earlier picture that we were close to the finish line, because that earlier picture said, OK, it's like an iceberg. We're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. And the tip of the iceberg are the stars. And the bottom part is the dark matter particle. And it might be a neutralino, or it might be axions. And it's a really simple story. And we're done. And we're near the finish line. The story is now less simple because, well, we haven't, you know, we have almost, we have sensitivity to see the axion or the neutralino, and we haven't seen it. So maybe the, we can use the same iceberg picture where the tip of the iceberg is the dark matter and the bottom of the iceberg is a whole nother dark sector, a whole nother world. And this is the piece that stands out because it's stable and there's a lot of it or whatever. And um, 
well, I don't know which picture it is. And there are no lack of, of, of great ideas. Uh, you can just go to a seminar any of the day of the week here on a new idea about dark matter particles. And this is a slide that Tim Tate put together. And so that, that picture is not finished. Um, there's plenty going on on the experimental side here. Uh, the super CDMS experiment, the, the LZ experiment uh, in South Dakota in the Sanford uh, laboratory in the home state gold mine and uh, experiments to look for axions. Um, let's see, dark energy. My colleagues used to accuse me of wandering around the hallway saying dark energy may, may, may be the most profound problem in all of science today. Um, and I probably did say that. Um, it's, it's really remarkable. Our understanding of it is that um, gravity can be repulsive because what sources gravity is the energy density plus three times the pressure. And so if this quantity is negative, um, gravity, even though its defining feature seems to be its attractiveness, is repulsive. And so you just need something that's very elastic. Um, and there is something that's very elastic. Uh, the energy of quantum nothingness. It has P equals minus rho. And uh, you should even be able to calculate the uh, energy of the quantum vacuum. Um, and when theorists calculate it, they don't really get an answer, they get infinity. So that's my way of defending. So that's not an answer, so you can't be wrong. Uh, but they don't get, they don't get the, the amount that's needed to speed up the universe. And in fact, if you use all the tricks in the book, the closest they can get to the right answer is 55 orders of magnitude too large. So this is what kind of theorists love, is you take one observation and now you've turned it into two problems. So what is the dark energy and why is the energy of nothingness so small? Um, and the best fit to the data really so far is lambda. Experiments have been done and P is minus rho to 4%. And some of the other things would, would predict something different. And so, um, some people would say, oh, we predicted that. This is evidence of the rich vacu vacuum structure of string theory and of the multiverse. So uh, you've got 10 to the 500 vacua, and so one of them is going to be close enough to what you see, and okay, that could be right. Uh, maybe it's related to inflation because that's also accelerated expansion. And so this is a big puzzle. Um, and speaking of inflation, before I go on to uh, talk about what we don't know, what we don't know we know. Um, so the microwave background really um, has done a great job in making inflation look plausible. And I should put, uh, where did I put? Flat universe. So when inflation first came out as a theory in 1982, the astronomers loved it. And they said, but you know, the the, I love that Higgs, I love that scalar field. I, I love that false vacuum energy. But you know, the part about the universe being flat, you got to change that because there's only 10% the amount of energy that's needed to make the universe flat. And so the dark energy came in, and and the flat universe is a big prediction of it. You saw the fit to the uh, acoustic peak structure of the microwave background. And inflations didn't say that the density perturbations are scale invariant, but almost scale invariant. They should differ from that by a few percent, and they do. Um, but with all of that, we have no standard model of inflation or can't even tell you when it took place. And so the hopes, uh, at least in the near term, are looking for the odd parity uh, mode of CMB polarization that would be produced by gravity waves that are also produced during inflation. And um, that would tell you a lot. So here's what it looks like. Um, looks, this is a, a simulation, actually this is real data, I think, um, uh, of the microwave sky. And these are little polarization vectors and you can see the swirling of the, of the odd parity B mode. Um, and I'll just put one equation up here. Um, if you were to measure, be able to detect this B mode polarization, and it's quantified by this parameter R, its strength relative to the density perturbations, 
Um, here's the formula for when inflation took place. So you would instantly answer that question. Um, so there are experiments looking to do that. And so I show another group of experiments that uh, people here are involved with. Let me go on uh, to the hard part of the talk, uh, what we know we don't know, uh, but I just call that predictions, right? Um, so uh, the one thing that great minds can agree on, Yogi Berra and Niels Bohr both said this, predictions are hard, especially about the future. And so I'm going to jump out there. Um, one prediction that I think is really easy is part of cosmology is the story of stars and galaxies. And I think um, that's going to be very exciting, interesting, and we're going to sort that out. And I'll just show you again. Um, I can't resist showing the JWST deep field um, compared. Uh, so this is the one that you that President Biden explained to everyone, so I'm sure you ex understand it. I can't do better than he did. And this is a similar region of the sky that's taken a long time before that with the Hubble. And um, boy, they look different. This one, the JWST really pops because it's looking in the infrared and the redshift has redshifted the light. And um, that's probably all I wanna say about this, but Having the ability, uh, it's like, who, did, who said it about robbing banks? That's where the money is. So if, if you're gonna do study the early universe, you wanna go where the photons are and they're in the infrared, not in the optical. And so that's, that's really gonna be uh, exciting. Um, I think this connection uh, between the very small and the very large is only gonna deepen. I think we're gonna learn uh, a lot more. There will be surprises. Oh, that's an easy one. <laughs> and uh, what's next? A paradigm shift, pull on a loose thread, focus on some big questions. So let me just finish up with a couple of uh, slides. So this is a slide I showed you earlier, and this was this paradigm shift in, in uh, cosmology uh, when uh, the the coming together of particle physics and cosmology happened. And literally the language changed. This was around 1980. And uh, you can't predict this. The language in 1970, only 10 years earlier, Alan Sandage, probably the, one of the greatest astronomers and cosmologists of the 20th century said, oh, cosmology, it's the search for two numbers. Q naught and H naught, and I'm, I doubt there's a single person in the audience except me. If Saul's here, he knows what Q naught is, but those are not numbers, well, H naught we uh, still look for, but um, anyway, so a paradigm shift, some big change, uh, we're not gonna see it until it hits us, um, but sometimes pulling on a loose thread, and so I wanna talk about the, the H naught and the Hubble trouble. So, uh, the most important number in cosmology is H naught, the expansion rate of the universe. One over it is like the age of the universe. And it has a really wicked history. This is its history from the earliest measurements around 600 um, to the present measurements around 70. And uh, this is a period right before uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and the uh, Hubble Key Project before it got reined in to a number that had error bars. The astronomers were so excited to get error bars, they put two error bars on. Uh, no, okay, one statistical, one systematic. Um, and the H naught really is the most important uh, parameter. And um, the precision has increased. And once again, uh, we, we have what looks to be a loose thread. So you can measure H naught in a couple of different ways. Um, let me start with the blue ways, is you can just measure how fast the universe is expanding by measuring distances to galaxies and their velocities nearby. And that's called the direct method. And uh, that's the blue band. And here's, you don't need to look at all the measurements, but they involve a variety of, of techniques. The other way you can measure it is looking at the expansion of the universe around the time the microwave background was formed. 
So you're not really measuring the expansion of the universe today, but because you have this Lambda CDM model, you can extrapolate forward and predict what it would be today. And if you do that, uh, you get 67 and a half. And if you average all these, you get 73. And according to Adam Reese, they differ by five sigma. Uh, and it really looks like two different bands. And you can recognize this sort of as an end-to-end -end test of cosmology. Measure how fast the universe is expanding today. Measure how fast it was expanding way back when. And so you have this model that should connect the two. They should, if you compare them in the right way, agree. And they don't agree. OK. Well, one, re one way, you know the obvious reasons they don't agree is there are mistakes with one or the other measurements, or both. But uh, one way, one reason they could disagree is that there's something missing in the model. And uh, so the theorists have been busy. And oh, well, we got dark energy today. Maybe there was an earlier period of dark energy um, that came and went. Maybe we there's some extra particles in the in the universe. And this, um, I want to show this. This is a list of models. You don't have to read that. Um, here is what they do: lifting the pink measurements towards the promised land, the blue today. And all of these theoretical models, you can see. Oh my God, they didn't quite. They don't quite get there, or they almost get there, but not quite. They have to rely on the error bar, maybe with the exception of that one. And another way of saying that is, none of these are compelling yet. Um, and so, uh, one or both of the measurements could be wrong, or there could be new physics. But it's a big mystery, and maybe this is the thread that takes us forward. Um, I want to finish up. Sometimes um, it helps to ask the right question. Uh, so what, what big question would you want to ask besides dark matter, dark energy, and inflation? And uh, two obvious ones that are really big questions, maybe they're not ripe to ask now, maybe they don't take you anywhere, are uh, the Big Bang. Uh, the Big Bang theory. Um, it's not really a theory about the Big Bang. It's a theory about the events after the Big Bang, or it's a TV show. But it's definitely not a theory of the Big Bang. And the multiverse. Oh, my goodness. Um, so according to general relativity, um, the Big Bang is the singular creation of matter, energy, space, and time. So there is no before the Big Bang, because that's when time was created. Of course, this is exactly where general relativity is unreliable, uh, where the quantum effect should be important. But maybe it, maybe it got the right answer for the wrong reason, or maybe so. May, but focusing on this and the emergence of space and time, that seems like a deep connection to particle physics. And so maybe the path forward involves sniffing around this question. Is, does it make sense to talk about before the Big Bang? Would string theory take you to a phase before the Big Bang? Is there a cyclic universe? And uh, the inflation, this gives me a headache. I'll tell you why it gives me a headache. Uh, so if you, if you uh, believe in inflation, or if, if you accept inflation, um, this uh, blowing up of a small bit of the universe happens a lot. And when a theorist tells you that, they're secretly saying infinity. So it happens a lot, OK? And you have these disconnected pieces of the universe. And um, if you marry that with, with string theory, or even if you don't, you end up with you know, a multiverse. And uh, the multiverse is what keep, gives me a headache, is that why does it give me a headache? Um, it may be the most important idea since Copernicus took us away from being at the center of the universe. Um, it could answer the before the Big Bang question. But how do you test this, since these pieces are totally just um, But it's out there. And ignoring it, I mean, you can't ignore it forever. OK, let me just finish. Um, this lambda CDM theory, um, speaking as probably the oldest cosmologist in the room, um, much more 
than any cosmologist I know ever hoped for. <laughs> it, it was a lot. And of course, then you get greedy. <laughs> I know that's more than what I asked for, but I want more, right? OK. Uh, it's given us big mysteries to address. So I told, talked about those three profound questions that may take us somewhere or nowhere, deep connections between the very big and the very small. And it's really transform, transformed our, our understanding of the universe. And I think it will, uh, it is likely to do much more in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Great question. Oh, Mike, oh, you call. So I, uh, I didn't hear you say the phrase anthropic principles, but would you consider the phrase at some point to be <laughs> um, yeah, well, I was I was told that I had to use um, you know G-rated language here, so I don't use the A word. Um, but there is this issue um, of why you know the physical constants are what they are, why the theory is what it is, and um, you know one interesting answer is that, uh, or the anthropic principle would say it is because. If it weren't, we wouldn't have gotten enough life to discover that it is. Now, there's a, a nicer version of that we may eventually have to face up to, which is the idea of uh, you know the multiverse where there's an ensemble that's created. And we could treat this like statistical mechanics. Um, but I would hope that we would spend some time focusing on, we got one universe in front of us. Do we really need the other 10 to the 50? So Sorry, 10 to the 500. Um, but we may, we may be forced to deal with that. And uh, my favorite dark matter particle, the axion, if you have axions in inflation, then you're forced to deal with the fact that you can't actually predict, except in a statistical way, how much axionic dark matter there is. But um, So that's not my cup of tea, but uh, maybe if we call it you know, the ensemble of the universe, uh, we'll, we'll have to address that problem sometime. Yeah, so, um, uh, so I hope I said uh, dark energy has repulsive gravity. So it, it really just fits within general relativity. Maybe we'll require a more complicated ex explanation of the accelerated universe, but um, dark energy is, and it's not even particles, it's a substance. So uh, we're used to there being particles and dark energy is a substance and it's very elastic and because it's so elastic its gravity i know this is hard to it's hard to wrap your head around it its gravity is actually repulsive so uh because it's so elastic because rho plus 3p is negative thank you B, B mode of the CMB polarization. So you can decompose the uh, polarization in, into various modes, you know, left and right circular, X and Y. But a very convenient way to decompose it in cosmology is into the odd and even parity modes. And the B mode is the odd parity mode. It's like the magnetic mode. And the reason that you would want to decompose it into even and odd is that only the gravity waves produced during inflation excite that B mode of polarization. And the amplitude of the gravity waves is directly related to uh, when inflation took place. And so this is a way to get in there and because we know there's the, the density perturbations. And they, they're out there, they're really big, 
And so they might be hiding the gravity wave ones if we just look at the temperature variation. But if you look at the polarization, in principle, uh, the B-modes are only excited by the gravity waves. Unfortunately, well, there's an asterisk that goes with that, but I'll, uh, uh, gravitational lensing can turn the E-modes into the B-modes, but that's a technical detail. But, but the B-modes are uh, really great because they could reveal the gravity waves and, and allow you, let me put a number on it, to dig a factor of 1,000 below where the density perturbations are. And so that's why people are excited about it. And if, if you detected them and in 2000, whatever year it was, 15, a group thought they found, found them, uh, boy, were people ex boy, was I excited. I think other people were excited too. Well, they found that the dust, dust creates polarized light and has, and, and has B modes associated with it. No, no, it's really just polarization of the microwave background. And um, these gravity waves, which ripple space time, give rise to polarization. So, so the question about how Yeah, well, the, the idea of that, I think that idea goes under the name of tired light that was actually invented by Fritz Zwicky. And uh, probably half the audience has referenced his 1933 paper on dark matter, which was mainly on tired light because that's what he was really interested in. It's the, the idea, um, recently there were measurements made in the laboratory. I mean, what these guys can do with lasers and gals is truly amazing. And so they were able to shine laser, uh, laser light along a long enough distance to actually, I believe, rule out this idea of tired light, that light uh, going through matter. Um, well, the laws of physics should apply everywhere, but. Yeah, what, what data are you most excited about? Um, uh, oh, the, the question. Yeah, I will repeat the question I'll, or I'll turn it into one that I can answer. Uh, the, the question was, what experiment are you most excited about? Is that more or less what you said? And uh, boy, that's, that is a really hard question because, um, oh my God, I have to give an answer. Can I phone a friend? Uh, I think the B modes, I think the B modes, I'm pretty excited about. The idea that if you detect the B modes, that's taking you back to the universe when it was 10 to the minus 36 seconds old. But I'm also pretty excited about dark matter experiments because that seems like a problem that we ought to be able to solve. And by the way, you know, we're about to launch two satellites, one by the Europeans, the Euclid satellite. I'm still on the first choice here, right? And also the, uh, the Roman satellite that was dreamt up here at Berkeley by Saul Perlmutter and his collaborators uh, to get at dark energy. I think um, there's just so many exciting things going on. But if you force me to pick one, I guess it would be the B-modes. Yeah. 
I'm wondering what that would look like and leave it normal and like anything else you could do to touch that. Um, so the the question had to had to do with the new physics that was resolved the small h naught and the early h naught and the late h naught and um, I should never have written extra radiation up there because I don't think it really works but I'll tell you what it is so it's the idea um, that there's uh, we know they're neutrinos uh, they don't contribute they're, they're radiation they're relativistic they don't contribute as much as photons. But there could be other particles uh, that are at even a lower level, and that would help shift things a little bit. Uh, what you're trying to do is change the sound speed in the universe around the time of decoupling. Problem is, it's really hard to have new ideas in, in cosmology these days because there's so many uh, hoops that you have to go through. And so that's what impinges all, that, that's what uh, crimps all the creativity. And so I think having a little extra radiation, so it's some particle species that decoupled early on, we don't even know its name. I don't think in these papers they, uh, I don't know, maybe it was a sterile neutrino or something, or a, a right-handed neutrino that decoupled early on. Uh, but it doesn't, none of them quite work. Um, the, when Lambda was introduced, uh, a couple of us wrote papers before the discovery was made. and and said, you know what, if we had a cosmological constant, we could solve five problems. I know how ugly the cosmological, that's what we said in the, or we know how ugly it is, but it solved five things all at once. Uh, and the, the models that have been put forward so far may be right, but they, they barely solve the problem. And you, you look at them and they're not, I don't even think their authors call them compelling. Um, but you never know. So, Michael, um, very interesting talk. So, it may not be direct effects to the main universe, but it could be quite something more complex. Like the length of the radio. And the observable position of the star stars and a natural constriction that will break the state of the whole cosmos. So, that aspect of it could be affected. It seems to just not exist. And so, while I like the part that you're trying to be why not? It works for fifty percent of the Catholics. <laughs> no, that was, sorry for the joke there. <laughs> um, so let me that that is an argument that my good friend Paul Steinhardt says that if you're going to buy into inflation, you have to take everything, the good with the bad. Yeah. And my answer to Paul is that. One thing we know for sure in science is we never get it right the first time. And so I, one thing I will bet the ranch on is the equations that we use to describe inflation are wrong. They're way too simple. And um, so that's, that's my retreat is that. I, I, don't, I don't agree. I, I'm, again, it's kind of like defending Particle theorists saying, no, 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 you didn't get you didn't get the weight of the of the quantum vacuum energy wrong. You got infinity. That's not an answer. So I can't grade you down on that because you don't have a. If you had a complete theory, I mean, let, let's give an example of a complete theory: quantum electrodynamics. It is a complete theory. You can calculate things. Maybe there's things you can't calculate as accurately you would want. So you can rule out that theory. It, it is a mature theory. Inflation is not a mature theory. It's this person's model. It's that person's model. Um, and so that would be my defense, is what, what we found was um, like the Bohr atom. So the Bohr atom uh, was a good stepping stone uh, to the, the full theory of the quantum mechanical atom. Um, Unfortunately, there are no atomic physicists who can <laughs> disagree with me here. But that would be my defense, is that um, we, we've got a partial theory. We, we don't have the full theory yet. And so there are pieces of it that may fall by the wayside. Um, well, I think by the spirit of my talk, you can say not as close as in the other areas. I think um, at one point there was a hope 
that understanding the origin of the baryon asymmetry would involve the electroweak phase transition and maybe the CP violation that we've already measured. And, um, um, you know, you can never say never, but I think that's a very hard road to hoe. I think you know, there are no viable theories that work that way. Um, we, it looks like ultimately gut scale physics will, or, you know, 10 to the 14 GeV physics is going to come into play. Um, in terms of understanding, I think it, I think we may be close to calling it leptogenesis. That um, the easiest route is to first make a lepton asymmetry and then transmute it into a baryon asymmetry with uh, B plus L violating effects that are in the standard model. But I think, and that's a really hard one because the scale of the physics involved is very bi is very big, and so. I think we're not very close, and it's kind of embarrassing because it's about us. It's not about that dumb dark matter and dark energy. It's about us. Oh. <laughs> So the, the, the first one, I could go find it. Uh, the first one with the acoustic peaks is not of matter, it's of the microwave background. So we're looking at the, the temperature in different directions. And so that's, that's of the microwave background, and that's a picture of uh, the universe at 400,000 years. Um, so it's, it's and you, you catch the, the baryons are oscillating at that time, trying to fall into the dark matter potential wells, and you catch them in different phases. The other, the one that looked just like a hump, is really the measure of the distribution of matter today. Um, the, uh, it's, it's the power spectrum of the density and homogeneity um, measured by different techniques. And Oh, I don't, well, I have to say ADMX because I was there at the very beginning and I'm, I'm rooting for those guys, uh, but there, there are a lot of really good experiments that, uh, Yeah, yeah, the dark matter radio is a, uh, I just want one of them to succeed. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.